Can you hear me? Más o menos? Can you guys, oh, you can hear me now, right? So I take myself apart. My name is Gretchen Lowey, and I have the pleasure of being um, one of the members of the Imperial Valley Social Justice Committee, and we're a co-sponsor um, for uh, the, this event and bringing um, Professor Gould here uh, with us um, to be a part of our MLK celebrations here in the Imperial Valley. Um, I'm gonna do just a couple of housekeeping things and then I'm gonna turn it over to the chair of the MLK committee, um, Marlene Thomas, who's gonna then help us move along. But um, restrooms, if you need a restroom, it's off to the right. Um, just go to the my right, right? Your left, my right. Um, uh, just go down that hall and when you get to the end, make a left and there's a restroom right there if you need that. Um, We'd like to thank Central Union High School District for making this possible for us um, to open it up to the community. We just had an event um, for the Stone of Hope honorees that some of you are at, um, but it's really wonderful for students to be here, which we really wanted, and community members. Um, Professor Gould will speak, and then it'll also be open to questions. Uh, we have books in the back, they're $25, um, so if you'd like him to sign one after we're over, and then he, we've, we've had a long day with him, but um, he'd be happy to talk with you. He, he likes the valley, so he would be happy to talk with you. Um, la única otra cosa que te voy a decir es que para uno persona de aquí no hablen, um, hablen inglés, pero prefieren español. Entonces voy a estar para allá traduciendo um, por el señor Gould. So si quieres ir a esta esquina para allá, um, si prefieres escuchar mi pobre español y no su inglés, entonces puedes escuchar mi pobre español, pero a mí me gusta traducir. Okay, other questions, any other, other questions? I was just saying that um, I if you'd rather hear this in Spanish, I will, um, I will uh, I'm gonna be over there translating. So Bill, I'm gonna be over there translating what you're saying. I hope I do it justice um, in what I do. All right, so I'm gonna bring up my partner in crime here. Um, I usually, but people would be upset, but usually when I do these meetings, I'd wanna go around and have every one of you tell Mr. Gould who you are and why you came, but you can do that individually because everybody would say, Gretchen, that'll go on forever if you do that. So Marlene, come on up. Thank you, Emily. <laughs> oh boy, good afternoon. Um, I'd like to, uh, on behalf of the Imperial Valley Social Justice Committee, welcome all of you here today. And this is really a very historic moment uh, in our time. And uh, we're so grateful that uh, Dr. Gruel uh, accepted our invitation. And one thing that I would like to say before I introduce, I know I, I, know I wasn't supposed to speak, but one thing I would like to say that it's very, very important that we get involved and stay involved in our community, what we call civic engagement. And the one thing about it, all of us have something we can offer. It doesn't matter if it just means taking a person to the poll or just checking on a neighbor or whatever. But also, I would hope that you also reach out to Imperial Valley Social Justice Committee. We're at 510 West Main, uh, room 111. And and get involved and participate. We do a lot of things. I'm not gonna go through a litany of it, but if you are interested in volunteering, please contact myself or Gretchen, uh, et cetera. And uh, you guys are all a, a cocktail of beautiful flowers today. We had an outstanding event <laughs> over at La Versaca. And for those that were there, you know that you witnessed something really great. And that's where we continue. In June, we will be putting out um, uh, our nomination papers. So be on the lookout for June for nomina nominating uh, someone who's making a difference, okay? If it happens to be a politician, it has to be their community involvement, really making a difference, genuinely giving out and doing something. We're not interested in titles, okay? I mean, because we all have a title, Mr. This, Mrs. That. So we're not <laughs> interested in titles. It's what you do, what you do to make a difference. At this time, um, to the um, Southwest 
um, school district and the superintendent and all those involved. We thank you for allowing us to come here and to have a meet and greet uh, with Dr. Gould. And I hope that some of you will also take a time to take a picture afterwards because this man is in the history books, okay? So it's, in, it's important. It gives me great honor at this, at this time to introduce to you the first Hispanic woman and first Hispanic board president of Central Union High School School Trustee District. And I'll make it short, I, I present to you, I'm trying to think of something odd to say. I, pre <laughs> I present to you someone who is a fighter, someone who is an advocate, someone who is, has courage to stand up for their convictions. And I, I really encourage you guys in this next election, don't vote for your friend. Don't vote for your neighbor. Vote for someone that you know that's gonna go out there and represent you on issues that matter to, to you, yourself, your family, and your community. And that's what this lady represents against all odds. I present to you, Diana Reese Garcia. I got it back with some okay. Thank you very much. Good evening. I wanna welcome everyone tonight. Um, we do ask that you keep your masks on at all times while inside, okay? I don't see anybody not following the rules, but anyway, um, a little list of people that have honored us today. Uh, first of all, Mayor Pro Tem, Marta Cárdenas of the Mal City of the Central. <laughs> Al Central Elementary Board Member, Michael Minix. There we go. <laughs> uh, Rosa Diaz, Executive Director of the LGBT, Imperial Valley LGBT Resource Center. Okay. Medals Board Trustee, Roberto Garcia. Uh, George Marquez, candidate for Imperial County District Attorney. And Dr. Todd Fernell, who had to step out for a minute, okay? Sorry, there's a medical emergency in the back. That's why I'm kind of <laughs> not um, paying attention here very much, but everything's okay. I think Dr. Fennell has everything under control. Okay. Um, tonight, we were given the great opportunity to present Dr. Gould, um, and he just kind of was dropped in our lap, and we embraced him. We thought, you know what? This is um, a perfect kickoff, not to just Black History Month, to just everybody's month. Um, we have the Women's Month that just passed, and we have our Hispanic Heritage Month that is coming up. We realize that everybody's history matters. We all have a history, and we sure as heck have a future, especially with people like Dr. Gould in our corner. So um, right now, the who is going to present him is my fellow board member, Maria Peinado, who has a history of a, a short, very short history of what he does and what he hopes to accomplish. So, Maria. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, it really is a true honor and privilege to introduce today's speaker and welcome him to our Central Union High School District and specifically to this campus, Southwest High School. Thank you, Madam President Garcia Ruiz for allowing me this honor. So um, again, I wanna do justice to Professor Gould. Um, I did have to reduce your summary somewhat, but I, I wanna make sure I cover your highlights. Um, so please bear with me. William B. Gould IV is a Charles B. A. Birdsley Professor of Law Emeritus at Stanford Law School. He's a prolific scholar of labor and discrimination law. He has been an influential voice in worker management relations for more than 50 years and served as chairman of the National Labor Relations Board, NLRB, from 1994 to 1998, and subsequently chairman of the California Agricultural Labor Relations Board from 2014 to 2017. As NLRB chairman, he played a critical role, role in bringing the 1994-1995 baseball strike to its conclusion and has arbitrated and mediated more than 300 labor disputes. He's been pretty busy. 
including the 1992 and 1993 salary, salary disputes between the Major League Baseball Players Association and the Major League Baseball Player Relations Committee. Gold also served as Special Advisor to the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development on project labor agreements from 2011 to 12, and as Independent Reviewer on Equal Employment Opportunity for the Mayor of San Francisco from 2020 to 21. Professor Gould was the first black law professor hired by Stanford University in 1971, and he still teaches at the university today. He is a critically acclaimed author of 11 books, including Diary of a Contraband, The Civil War Passage of a Black Sailor. In 1958, Gould's father found his grandfather's diaries in the attic. For 30 years, Professor Gould pieced together his great-grandfather's story, and Stanford, and Stanford Press published the book containing his grand grandfather's diaries in 2002. The story remains as relevant today as it was when it was first published. His most recent book is For Labor to Build Upon, Wars, Depression, and Pandemic, which will be published by Cambridge University Press in April of this year. The book draws comparisons between the crisis of the coronavirus, COVID-19 um, pandemic, and crises in other time periods, such as the First World War, the Great Depression, and World War II, when pressures for labor market changes and reform were vehicles for, for the diminution of inequality. Given his countless academic accomplishments and the doors he has opened in academia for students of color specifically, the Central Union High School District School Board found it most appropriate to host Professor Gould as a guest speaker on a school campus and specifically to kick off the Central Union High School District's Black History Month celebration. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Professor William Gould IV this afternoon. Well, I, I really uh, want to uh, thank you very much, Maria, for that kind introduction, and, and it uh, puts me in mind of uh, the uh, kind reception and uh, good friends that I've met here uh, since uh, coming here on this occasion. This is my third visit to this uh, area. Uh, I uh, first, uh, and you know, I want to thank uh, particularly uh, my uh, good good pals, uh, Marlena and uh, and uh, Gretchen, for who they were, who they uh, we talked a number of times about this visit, and and also uh, Mario Mario Bustamante, who uh, helped me on uh, the second visit that I made here. Uh, the first time I uh, came to this general area, and I can see in the map that I really wasn't as close to you as uh, uh, you would think is particularly close. I went to the a town called Mecca, uh, where the Governor Brown appointed me uh, in uh, 2014. And I saw uh, uh, something that I had never seen before, the, uh, the farm workers uh, living, in their, um, uh, living in their cars uh, and uh, uh, in these uh, shopping centers uh, and uh, uh, desperate to uh, just find a way to uh, survive uh, when uh, uh, they put the food on our table that uh, all of us so frequently uh, take uh, for, for granted. And then three years after that, uh, I uh, had met uh, both uh, Gretchen and Mario in Sacramento, and I uh, returned uh, here, and they arranged uh, Mario, uh, Bustamante was, uh, uh, was my interpreter when we went down to uh, talk to the workers as they were coming across from Mexicali uh, to, um, uh, to uh, Calexico. And uh, uh, this was uh, just five years ago. And, uh, you know, I, we were able to, I was able to speak with them through Mario <coughs> to find out uh, what they were, what their wages were, what their conditions of work were, were they getting reimbursed uh, for the cost of traveling to their work? Because some of the fields are considerable distance from the place that they uh, come across. And also, 
what their spouses were doing, what kind of earnings were their spouses receiving uh, in uh, Mexico. And then we had a, uh, uh, we had a, uh, we, you know, it began about 11 o'clock at night and we were together till about three o'clock in the morning before we uh, then uh, went to have uh, breakfast today, breakfast together. And, and this was a critical part, uh, as I said uh, earlier today, of uh, Dr. King's uh, uh, focus uh, for, uh, he was uh, in Memphis uh, looking at the, uh, trying to uh, work with uh, the, the, the sanitation workers in Memphis who were on strike. Uh, and he uh, uh, was uh, concerned about them and, and uh, at their, their pay at substandard, substandard uh, rates. And uh, uh, I, uh, I think that uh, one of the things that makes me uh, uh, so uh, interested in this area uh, and important to uh, California, to the United States, and to the world is the, the strong connection that exists here between, uh, has existed here historically, between uh, the African-American and Mexican-American uh, communities, uh, the, uh, uh, the, the historic march undertaken by uh, Jesse Jackson and Cesar Chavez together, and the uh, litigation commenced by uh, the NAACP uh, in the 1950s against uh, uh, school segregation. And uh, I've learned so much about that, uh, 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 not only uh, from Marlene and, and uh, Gretchen and Mario and others, but uh, uh, reading and reading things that they have uh, sent me, and also uh, moving around uh, and speaking uh, uh, to you. And I suppose, uh, uh, you know, when I come to a high school, I think of, of often uh, many years ago my own uh, experience as a as a high school student. I found uh, some of the teachers. Uh, uh, really uh, inspiring. Uh, uh, the, uh, I had a teacher in American history whose words I still quote today in my lectures uh, in labor law, whose words I quote uh, in this most uh, recent book that Maria made uh, reference, uh, reference to. High school is a, a tremendous time to begin your uh, education and begin to uh, uh, develop your sense of justice uh, toward uh, your fellow man. And I suppose uh, my message to you uh, this afternoon is the message that I uh, gave earlier today at our luncheon, or, uh, and that is that uh, uh, I, I really see uh, the average person. We are, we are, we're not famous people. We're not, we don't have uh, Martin Luther King in our names. We, we don't have uh, the Kennedys in our names, uh, but we're people who try to do uh, in our daily lives uh, the very best that we can to make uh, the world, uh, in this country in particular, uh, to shape it uh, so that uh, uh, the future generations will have uh, uh, great, better opportunities than we saw. In you know, I look back to the time of the Constitution which was formulated in 1787. And uh, uh, Richard Kluger, who wrote a wonderful book called Simple Justice, I commend it to you, it was published in 1975, Simple Justice. He said, there was no talk then about ideas about universal suffrage, the rights of labor, which I've devoted much of my career to the equality of women free public education, concepts that would have been as alien to the delegates there in Philadelphia in 1787 as the uh, wireless te telegraphy and uh, internal combustion engine. Uh, what should not have been alien to them, uh, Kluger said, uh, was uh, the, the, the principles of human equality. The principles of human equality because uh, uh, those uh, principles had just been so glowingly asserted uh, just 11 years earlier at the time of the Declaration of Independence by the very same, many of the very same delegates who sat there in 17, uh, 
87. But Kluger says, but here in 1787, there was no talk that all men were created equal. There wasn't uh, uh, any talk of that they would be treated equally before the law or have equal opportunity to scale life's cliffs of adversity. Uh, no such language did they write into the Constitution. No such egalitarian rights were, were guaranteed. And so the struggle was really to uh, take place in what Eric Foner, a very outstanding Reconstruction historian, has said was our second Constitution. Our second Constitution, which took place in the 19th century. The great post-Civil War amendments to the Constitution, the fashioning of the, the promise, uh, if not the realization, of equality. And uh, this is where I uh, uh, draw inspiration from my own great-grandfather, uh, William B. Gould, who escaped slavery in North Carolina in 1862, September 1862. He joined the Union Navy the uh, very day that President Lincoln was convening his cabinet to uh, uh, determine to issue a what they called the, a preliminary emancipation proclamation that uh, um, uh, saying to the southern states which were in rebellion that they did not cease it by January 1, uh, uh, the uh, uh, the uh, uh, slaves in all the states uh, would be free. And William B. Gould, uh, when he joined the United States Navy, was a contraband. That's why the book is called Diary of a Contraband. He kept a diary from 1862 to 1865. Contraband seized, you know, seized property because they didn't know what to do because the Dred Scott decision, which, you know, uh, declared uh, black African Americans to be property and not human beings uh, uh, given protection under our Constitution. Uh, that was still the law of the land in 1862 when William B. Gould uh, escaped slavery uh, and uh, left uh, Wilmington uh, to fight against the Confederacy would-be King Jeff, as he called uh, uh, Jefferson Davis, uh, for the United States uh, Navy and uh, to help uh, disrupt enemy supply routes, uh, both uh, first in the, in the southeastern part of the United States and then uh, in uh, Europe, uh, where uh, uh, Britain and France were building uh, formidable ironclad ships which uh, uh, the Confederate, to supply the Confederacy with help. And William B. Gould went to Europe to head off with, with his comrades to head off uh, uh, this, uh, uh, this uh, attempt. His life, the life of my great-grandfather, like uh, Brown against Board of Education, 1954, which inspired you here in Merced County to uh, dismantle segregation or attempt to dismantle segregation, these things are the uh, inspiration uh, of my life. And I, as I said at lunch today, I hope that they will be of some uh, relevance uh, to, uh, to you here uh, in El Centro. Uh, for William B. Gould uh, was a foot soldier for equality in the midst of the most perilous and world-shaking struggle. His work, like that of uh, MLK, Martin Luther King, uh, in, the, uh, previous, uh, in the previous century, was to revise and to make uh, more perfect uh, the, uh, uh, the work that was done in Philadelphia, the imperfect work, uh, the work that... Uh, 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 was imperfectly done in 1787. And so it was that he and 17,000 black sailors, 7,000 of them, 
escaping from the Confederate States like himself. 17,000 black sailors joined the United States Navy. This was the, the underground railroad in a very different sense than you have heard the, that expression used previously. This was arms in the hands of slaves. Arms in the hands of slaves so that they could uh, make free uh, their comrades and to build a better uh, uh, country. And they were seeking to realize uh, not only their freedom, but the promise of equality uh, and to, uh, as Martin Luther King said in 1963, to, uh, to cash uh, the uh, uncashed promissory note uh, that uh, the country had made uh, uh, at, at, the, uh, at its beginning. And so some say that today we are going through a new reckoning um, uh, as the result of uh, uh, the murder of uh, George Floyd in Minneapolis last year and the uh, emergence of uh, Black Lives Matter, very important uh, uh, development, uh, statues like uh, those of Robert E. Lee, who betrayed his country, uh, are uh, coming down. And posthumously, William B. Gould has had a park dedicated to him in, uh, in Massachusetts, just south of Boston, where he settled after the war. And a statue may be constru constructed there. But one of the points I made today at lunch and that I want to make to you again is that uh, um, the uh, important thing in the future is, as important as statues are, and providing recognition for those uh, who went before, uh, we don't want to really get obsessed or preoccupied uh, with uh, the removal or even the creation of statues as important statutes, as important as that is. Uh, I, I, I feel that we get diverted sometimes uh, as uh, the people who live near me in San Francisco did when they uh, destroyed the uh, statue of uh, General Grant, the invincible Grant, as William B. Gould called him in his diary, the invincible Grant, who, uh, who uh, pro promoted uh, equality both during the war and in the Reconstruction uh, era, and uh, uh, I, I really uh, hope that uh, the lesson I will leave, the message I can leave with you is that uh, it's these foot soldiers uh, uh, like William B. Gould, the people that we are only vaguely aware, don't think much about, and I, I mentioned today at lunch, uh, people who, uh, who, who don't get very much uh, mention, uh, Roy Wilkins, uh, uh, Walter White of the NAACP played such a critical role when it was dangerous to go, much more dangerous than it is today despite this explosion of uh, weapons and uh, the problems that we have uh, today. It was um, dangerous to go in, into uh, certain areas of the country, you, you, uh, much more than today. And uh, Fannie Lou Hamer, and Hosea Williams, the people that uh, uh, came, uh, came along in the uh, 60s, uh, they didn't uh, uh, falter in uh, their commitment to principle. And so uh, uh, they were, uh, like William B. Gould, foot soldiers, foot soldiers, and uh, uh, not just uh, uh, for themselves, but for the, the collective interest for the interest of uh, all of us. They felt the sting of discrimination. William B. Gould in his diary writes about uh, the, uh, he never writes about how he felt it, but he, he writes about the experiences of others around him and how he felt it for them. Uh, and this is uh, the, uh, uh, this, this I think is really the, the point that uh, uh, Harvard uh, scholar Robert Putnam made in this very interesting book that he wrote uh, just in the past uh, year uh, called uh, The Upswing, How America Came Together. He talks about the We Society, um, uh, where we recognize and act upon 
an obligation to our fellow man or woman, especially including the no tests, especially those of the words of the the no testament the New Testament's comfortable words. Come to me all of you that travail and are heavy laden. And uh, this is the part of the, uh, I don't know if it uh, exists in many of the uh, services today, but this is part of our Episcopal uh, Eucharist, our Episcopal Mass. This is the part where my father and I would look at each other. Uh, this is the heart of Christianity. This is the heart of religion, uh, what religion should be, and the heart of what our society should be. And um, so I hope that uh, uh, all of you uh, uh, can be uh, foot soldiers. Uh, to, if you get the basics, get the, get the good education that uh, is available to you and make the use of what you have in front of you. And I hope that uh, you'll be inspired by some of this history and principle and that you'll, uh, you, Martin Luther King said, uh, uh, we must not be silent. We must not be, uh, we must not be silent in the, uh, as we see injustice uh, around us. I hope you won't be silent and uh, that you will speak out. Uh, so that I want you, as I said uh, at lunch today, to be foot soldiers in this new uh, uh, century of our history, and and uh, I think this is the way you can honor Martin Luther King and uh, his uh, uh, tradition, and uh, uh, that has emerged uh, in his name. And uh, it's really a again a delight to be with you to see uh, Marlene and uh, to see uh, Gretchen and Mario, and uh, to make so many new friends. Uh, uh, like uh, Maria, who introduced me, and uh, like Diana, you know, the, the I've uh, and to know about and know about uh, uh, Heber, and uh, to meet the postmistress of Heber, to meet the uh, postmaster of Brawley, Brawley and uh, uh, to know uh, much more, and to uh, uh, I hope to uh, learn from uh, you, uh, and perhaps. Uh, uh, give you the opportunity to uh, 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 to uh, to use some of what I have to say in your own lives, and I, I wish you well, and I'd be glad to take any questions uh, that you uh, that you have. If anybody. <laughs> Yeah, if he's just going to step to get some water. If anybody um, has any questions, raise your hand. You're more than welcome to come up here and ask your questions, or you can just stand up and tell. Okay, anybody? Any questions? Yes. I, I would like to know uh, from uh, Jamil how he felt when they discovered uh, his, uh, his great grandfather's diary and knowing that his grandfather was. Hold on, I, I need to repeat it so that because we are going to transmit this later on on our channel. So her question, Marlene's question is, how you felt, Dr. Gould, when you found your great father's diary? Correct. Diary. Yeah. Go ahead. Yes. Well, of course, uh, Marlene, I I didn't find it. My father found it. Uh, uh, my father, uh, uh, my father was. Uh, a favorite of uh, one of my great uncles, one of the sons of my great grandfather, who died and bequeathed uh, his property uh, to my father. And my father went to the house and uh, looked in the attic. There were already things being thrown out and uh, uh, discovered these three volumes of uh, uh, this diary. Uh, which uh, begins September 27, 1862, and uh, finishes September 29, 1865. And uh, uh, my father uh, would sit in the living room reading this, and he said to me, this is something you better take a look at. And uh, you better 
read and see what you can find out about this. Uh, and so uh, uh, it's very, very exciting uh, uh, development to, to, uh, to see uh, uh, something like this. And he, he writes, amazingly, we don't know, given the fact that education, formal education was prohibited for black Americans in the Confederate States part of the world. We don't know how he learned his uh, to read and write, but he, he is very well informed and reads and writes about uh, not only his daily experiences about but what is going on, what he's reading in newspapers and journals. And he writes for uh, uh, journals. Uh, now, when we got this diary, in, uh, 18, in 1985, 1958, 1958, uh, we uh, did not know very much about William B. Gould. Uh, he was born in Wilmington, North Carolina, 1837, and died in uh, Dedham, Massachusetts, just south of Boston, 1923. Uh, and uh, only as I began to do some research uh, uh, and the first discovery was in the National Archives where I found the, uh, the, the, the log of the ship that he served on. And it, uh, uh, it shows the day that he came on board and it identifies seven other comrades of his. It says eight contraband came on board. That was the tip off, contraband, because the North had devised prior to the Emancipation Proclamation this idea that uh, they are seized property. They, they can fight with us. They are, they, they are property to be seized. And I saw on the log contraband. And I saw that it had a line showing names of masters, who they are. Well, uh, of course, uh, a number of things. One is that uh, it uh, enhanced, if it needed enhancement already, uh, the uh, awe in which I was beginning to feel uh, toward uh, William B. Gould, this uh, uh, man who uh, wrote and spoke so confidently and with such uh, articularity um, and, and knowledge, who was, a, who was a very much like my father, who was a very understated man, who was, uh, uh, had a dry, understated wit uh, about him. And so uh, this discovery uh, of his status uh, uh, put me more in awe of him, point number one, and also uh, sent me down all kinds of other avenues in my research uh, which I had not pursued uh, uh, previously. There were so many doors that opened in this 30-year period. And then uh, you would you would find something, and then the door would shut. You would not be able to pursue it uh, further. And they, just to give you an example, um, I went to Wilmington, North Carolina. Once I knew that that is where he had come from, knew where he had escaped, and I went to a seminar in this very elegant antebellum mansion that had been constructed prior to the war. One of, one of the South's most elegant. I went to the seminar and I admired the tapestry on the walls, the work that had been done, beautiful work, thinking, as we know, that most of this beautiful work was done by black workers who were enslaved. And then, I returned back to Stanford, and uh, a few uh, 
weeks later, I got this very excited call from uh, the curator of that mansion saying that they had discovered the slave quarters in back of the house and they had come upon portions of the plaster that had been used in these walls and that they had the initials of the workers who had done it. And there it was, WBG, William Benjamin Gould, in that plaster. Well, there are many moments, many moments like that, that uh, I felt uh, deeply, uh, I felt uh, uh, deeply emotional uh, because uh, I was reminded of the great obstacles that he had to overcome. And I also was very excited because I thought it would take me further in finding out more about him. Uh, so uh, it has been a uh, uh, tingling, tingling experience uh, uh, for me and uh, one which has uh, deepened my sense of uh, the history of our country and uh, the work that William B. Gould did. Why did I choose to go into law school? Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. You were it's okay. Uh, why did you choose to go into law school? Um, nobody in my family had ever been a lawyer. And there's no nobody in my family as a other than me as a lawyer. Uh, I I became in the 1950s when I was in high school uh, very much interested in. Uh, political life in America and uh, very much interested in the struggle that was unfolding to uh, break down segregation in the public schools. And uh, when I was a senior in high school, the Supreme Court decided Brown against Board of Education, declaring. So I, I uh, developed a great interest in Thurgood Marshall, who later uh, you may know, uh, President Johnson, Lyndon Johnson appointed to the Supreme Court in 1967. Uh, Thurgood Marshall was um, enormously successful in, in breaking down uh, uh, the walls of uh, discrimination. And I, I became convinced, to make a long story short, that the law could be uh, a vehicle, a subordinate vehicle perhaps, but a vehicle nonetheless which can play some role in improving the lives of people who need uh, help. And uh, uh, I would say Brown against Board of Education made me uh, particularly interested in becoming a lawyer. And uh, from there, I developed this interest in labor law and uh, employment discrimination law. I went on uh, to uh, represent a number of black workers in the uh, courts in, uh, bef uh, even after I was teaching in Detroit and uh, uh, where I represented uh, a group of workers who received the first punitive damage award ever uh, provided by the courts under, the, under our employment discrimination law. So uh, that's really why I became a lawyer. Surely, yeah, I think that uh, there are uh, 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 insights and experiences that, uh, uh, that uh, uh, minorities, blacks, other minorities and uh, women uh, have uh, exposure to uh, uh, that uh, uh, the uh, average uh, person perhaps uh, particularly in the law arena and particularly in a, 
relatively rarefied, uh, the rarefied environment of a uh, good university wouldn't have had uh, uh, exposure to. Um, I, uh, I, I, I don't think that, uh, uh, that I, I think that there were, of course, uh, many of our faculty who were uh, interested in some of the, uh, uh, the subjects that I, I, I'm interested in and that hold views that are akin to mine. But uh, I think that uh, 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 the idea of, uh, uh, of greater diversity is a very positive one. Um, uh, you know, I think Justice Powell uh, in the Bakke decision in 1978 said that, uh, looked at Harvard University and, and saw that Harvard was interested in getting kids from all over the country, you know, with diverse geography, <laughs> diverse income, diverse experiences. And Paul said, why isn't, why shouldn't, uh, uh, race, national origin, be one of the factors that a university should be able to use. And that began, really, uh, uh, the, the imprimatur uh, for affirmative action uh, for diversity began, really, with, uh, uh, with Bakke. And regrettably, it appears as though it could well come to a screeching halt under uh, this uh, uh, Supreme Court, uh, uh, which uh, has two major cases before it involving both uh, Harvard and the University of North Carolina, both a private school and a public school. And all the indications are that a majority of the Supreme Court doesn't hold these uh, views and uh, uh, will try to turn this back. But I think that enormous progress for our country and our society has been made through uh, diversity. Out of all the cases that you've taken on, is there one that has left an impact on you? Well, first of all, keep in mind that, uh, um, and, and this is somewhat, first of all, I, I have practiced uh, as, a, as a practicing lawyer prior to the time that I went into teaching. And when I went into teaching, I began to handle some of these uh, uh, civil rights cases that I alluded to partially uh, earlier, I would say, uh, so I, I don't want to, you know, you, you know, most of my work, much of my work has been uh, academic work, uh, writing of articles, writing of books, but I would say that uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the biggest case that has had an impact upon me and I think uh, our fellow citizens is this case that I alluded to earlier, this case called Stamps Against Detroit Edison which was decided in the 1970s and which was the uh, first decision to uh, uh, provide for uh, punitive damages as well as back pay and damages which compensated people who were locked into lower level jobs as the result of past discrimination, compensation in the future w w while they had to wait for the opportunities to become available. No one, no court uh, was going to, or I don't think should have, uh, bumped people out of jobs that they uh, held, uh, that, that uh, perhaps others should have held in the past. But, but this case established a concept called front pay, uh, where workers were compensated for not only the losses that they had encountered, experienced in the past, but those that they would experience in the future while they were waiting to uh, get promoted. And I would say probably uh, that case, which went on for a decade and which was uh, finally settled on behalf of uh, uh, somewhere between uh, uh, about 100 workers for uh, 4 million jobs, $4 million, and uh, for uh, 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 increased job opportunities is the case where I've been able to make uh, the greatest impact through litigation in the courts. Thank you. Any other 
any other questions before we move on? Okay. We okay. do have a small presentation for you oh. from our school district. Um, it's a small paperweight with the commitment to excellence from our district. Oh, okay, we like to present to you. you go. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. And it, it truly was an honor to have you here. Oh, thank truly you. Truly was. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you. We're going to wrap it up. Okay. Um, I want to thank everyone for coming. I know it was very short notice. Uh, we were, like I said, this opportunity was just dropped in our lap and we took it. You know, how could you say no? <laughs> but uh, once again, we're happy. Oh, for those of you that uh, wanted to buy a book and he had run out, we got some more from the car. So they're there and he's welcome you're welcome here to come up to him if you were too shy to give us a, a a question or anything you can do it there personally with him okay thank you very much okay thank you very much for coming